Hello, everybody, and welcome to our study that continues in the book of Philippians, and we're jumping right into chapter 2. But before we jump in, I want to give a little bit of context on what we can expect and what we're talking about here in the book of Philippians. So we know that it's Paul writing here, and um, he's writing this letter to the church in Philippi uh, while he's actually in prison. So I'm sure if you caught chapter 1, then you'll see, you'll hear a little bit more about the background of this book. But we know this, that despite all the challenges that Paul is going through, he's still carrying himself with such joy and gratitude and the right attitude. And he actually considers his imprisonment as favor from God. And he rejoices that he gets to suffer on behalf of Christ so much. There's so much to this, guys. And I just want you to get ready. We're going to jump right in to chapter two. and We're going to pick right up where Paul begins to encourage the people and how we should live, conduct ourselves, living in unity and in humility. So let's jump in, guys. Let's do it. Chapter 2, verse 1, and I'll read through 4, and then we'll pause. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Is there any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? I'll pause right there. These are four questions they're all rhetorical questions. What does that mean? It means Paul's not asking. Um, he's not asking because he's looking for an answer. It's rhetorical, meaning, of course, the answer is yes. It's almost like he's saying, is water wet? Is our rocks hard? Is the fire hot? Yes, yes. So he's asking these rhetorical questions because basically what he's saying is, if we've received these wonderful things from Jesus, then we have a responsibility to live our lives out a certain way. So this is what he goes on to say in verse three. I'm sorry, verse two. He says, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working, working together with one mind and purpose. He's saying, look, if you've been encouraged by belonging to Christ, if you've had any comfort from his love, if you've had fellowship in his spirit, if your hearts are tender and compassionate, if all of these things are happening, then because we receive these wonderful things, this is how we ought to live. This should be our response, and this is our responsibility, to live in unity and humility with one another. Let's keep going. Let's go to verse 3. Verse 3 says, don't be selfish. That's a big one. That's something we've been learning since we were little, little kids. Don't be selfish. What does the word selfish mean? Selfish is someone who's concerned only with their own welfare, someone who's self-willed, seeking opportunities for promotion at the expense of others. That sounds like somebody that maybe doesn't get along with a lot of people. They're willing to step on others to climb the ladder. They're looking out for themselves and not for other people. Paul is very clear. He's like, if you receive any of these things from the Lord, live in humility, be unified, and don't be selfish. Don't be selfish. It goes on to say, don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. This is Christian Living 101. I'll go, on to say, I'll go ahead and say this. If you want to be more like Christ, if you want to be, let's just put it this way, if you want to be a better Christian, then think, find ways to think of others as higher than yourselves. And go, go as, I'll go as far to say this. Find out what the interests or the needs of other people are and help to meet those needs, even if that means you don't benefit at all from doing so. Because after all, that's what Jesus did for us when he gave his life willingly for us on the cross. He gave everything up. He took on our sin and exchanged his righteousness and freely gave that to us. So Jesus is the example of what that looks like. So let's, let's keep going. Let's go forward. Verse 5 says, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. So now we, we go from this first section when we're talking about living in unity and humility. Now we're going on and we're going to see what Jesus did. We're going to look at the example of what Jesus did for us. And now we're getting a command here 
to live like Jesus lived, but not only that, but to have the same attitude as him. So we shouldn't just, you know, we, we're not supposed to just look at Jesus in, in, in awe and in worship. Of course we are. We give Jesus awe and worship and reverence and we look to him and how glorious and how magnificent he is. But we shouldn't just look from afar and say, wow, Jesus, Jesus did that. That was amazing. But now we're commanded to have the same attitude that Jesus had while he lived in this earth. Jesus had a humble attitude. He had an obedient mindset and he lived out what we are supposed to live out. He set the bar for our lives. So look, it says, though he was God, verse six, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling, as something to, cling to. Okay, so what does this mean here? So now, in our life, we can humble ourselves and serve and love others the same way Jesus did for us. Jesus was God, clearly was God. Clearly he existed for all of eternity and he was God. And it says here, though he was God, he was God. He didn't cling to that. In other words, he didn't make, he didn't use his title and his divinity to make himself above anybody or, or to make himself more important, in, more important than others. But instead he made himself subject to being a man. He was born, he grew up as a child, he learned, he picked up a trade as his father, he was a carpenter, he worked hard, he got up in the morning, I'm sure, clock didn't work. He did all of that, he lived as a man, even though he was still God. He didn't cling to his titles. And I'll, I'll say this, you might be a respected leader. I'm sure some, some of you right now are probably um, hardworking business owners. Um, maybe you're a renowned author. You, you may have a, a, just a respected track record, something that's hard to earn. You have titles that you've earned and you've worked hard for, and I believe you've worked hard for those. But you shouldn't cling to those titles or those achievements as a way to avoid living life humbly as Christ has shown us. Jesus showed us an example that he was in heaven and in div div divinely God himself, yet he lived life as a man humbly serving our needs and subjecting himself to obedience to God. So make, make this your goal. Instead of making the goal of making a name for yourself, let this be your goal. Live like Christ. Let that be your ultimate goal. Let's keep going. Let's look at verse seven. It said, it says, instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Again, we, we, we already talked about that, but he made himself a slave. He took that position of a bond servant, someone who was subject to a way of living. He did that too. He willingly gave himself and he wasn't forced into this. He did it willingly for you and I. Let's look at verse eight. It says, uh, and then verse 7 finishes and says, when he appeared in human form, verse 8 goes on to say, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. So Jesus was obedient, not just by being born, not just by growing up, not just by doing his ministry and healing the sick and making disciples, but he was obedient all the way to his death on a cross. He made himself obedient all the way to death on a cross. So Jesus, his obedience led him to his death. Now this is gonna be a crazy question, but I want you to think about this. Where does your obedience begin and where does it end? If your obedience has an end point, then I think we need to rethink how, how much we're willing to obey and live for God. Christ paved the way for all of us to live in obedience as he was. Does your obedience have a price tag on it? Or is your obedience to God willing to be bought by material things? Is your obedience to God willing to be purchased because of a, a, a promotion or a title? I remember one time, just a quick story I'll share with you. One time my car was getting towed. This is a funny story. My car was getting towed and, and I, was in, I was doing ministry at this time, but I parked in the wrong spot. 
My car was getting towed. I, I stepped away from my car for 30 seconds, realized I was in the wrong spot, was walking back to my car. And as, I was, as I'm walking back to my car, a, a tow truck is pulling up. He's pulling my car. He's backing in. He's, and, and I'm looking at this happening right in front of me. So I jump in the car. I, I, I'm starting to turn the car on. And I see in my rear view mirror, he backs right up to me. And he, sees, he, he knows I'm there, but he's going to tow my car. So I jump out and say, hey, whoa, 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 what's going on? I'm here. I'm, I jumped out for 30 seconds. I'm ready to go. And he says, sir, you walk that way, which I know you're walking to the, his offices, but this is parking lot for a restaurant. You parked in the wrong spot. And I said, oh, well, I'm hungry. I'm getting ready to eat. That was a big lie. I was not being honest. I'm getting ready to eat. I'm getting ready to go get some food. He goes, no, sir, you were walking that way. Why were you walking that way? So I'm going back and forth. I'm arguing. I said this big lie. I'm trying to stick with it. I'm telling you, this is bad. <laughs> and I'm, in, I'm getting ready to do some ministry. And I parked in the wrong spot, and I'm lying here. Okay. So now I'm sitting in the tow truck with him. He's taking my truck to the yard. Um, and I, I said this big lie. And you know I had to get picked up. I had the ministry. I still had to follow through. I'm, I'm getting ready to teach this class and I feel so convicted by God. I feel so convicted. And I heard the Holy Spirit tell me, were you willing to sell your obedience and your integrity for $300? Because that's how much it would be to get my truck out, $300. I was willing to sell my obedience and my integrity for $300. And I said, no, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. So I called the tow yard and I said, can you please give me the number for that tow truck driver? I want to just confess and tell him the truth and, and just be honest with him. They gave me his number. They had him call me, and I just told him everything. I said, sir, I was lying. I was not being honest. I was heading there just as he said, and I was not going there to get food. And my integrity is telling me that I, I need to speak up and just tell the truth to you. I know that this isn't going to mean you're going to give me my truck free, and they didn't give me my truck <laughs> for free. I still had to pay the $300, but at least I didn't lose my integrity and my obedience. I was honest in that moment. And I came clean. Now, what, what am I saying here? What am I, what am I saying? For some of us, our obedience can be bought and can be purchased. But Jesus gave us the example. He, it was all the way to the cross. His obedience led him all the way even to the point of death. His, his obedience and his honor to God could not be purchased. And he made himself subject to the obedience of God. And I believe we can do the same. If Jesus did it for us, then we can subject ourselves to obedience to God at any cost, even if that means to the point of death. Okay, so $300 is nothing compared to what Jesus did in obedience to God. Let's keep going forward. That was a quick story I wanted to share with you, but let's keep going. Let's look at, um, um, let's keep going, and we're going to look at the response of what God does because of Jesus' obedience, starting at verse 9. It says, Therefore, God elevated him, elevated Jesus to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. Why? Because he was obedient, because he was obedient even to the point of a criminal's death on a cross, a humiliating death. He was humble and he was obedient. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Man, look at the, the, the swing of events. Jesus humbled himself to the lowest point, took upon himself all sin, died a criminal's death that he did not deserve, was humiliated before man. And God then turned around and exalted him and elevated him to the highest point of honor that any person could possibly achieve. Jesus was there, the name above every name. Now every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in the same way, when we submit ourselves in obedience to God, we let God do the exalting in our lives. Never trade that responsibility with God. You don't ever want to find yourself in a place where you're trying to exalt yourself because then the opposite will happen. We'll be humbled before the Lord. The Bible goes on to say that in James, that those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let's humble ourselves. Let's, let's obey um, at, at any cost and let God do the exalting. Let God do the promotion in our lives. Let God take care of all that. God will make a way for you. You don't have to try and force your way. Just humble yourself. Just obey, obey at any cost. 
and God will take care of the rest. Let's keep going. Verse 12. So now we jump into what, how is it that we should live out our, in, in, in our Christian way? How is it that it looks for us? So let's, let's start from verse 12. So Paul starts to address the people. He says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. In other words, the church has been very obedient. You've been obedient. You've been walking with God. So he says, and now that I'm away, it is even more important. That's, that's a good note there. Are we obedient just when, you know, when leadership is around? Are we obedient when people can see? Or are we also obedient when no one else can see and no one else will know? It says this, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Now, I don't want us to get confused here. This scripture is not saying work hard to be saved because we did nothing to be saved except put our faith in what Jesus has done. We're saved because of the work that Jesus did for us, not the work we do, okay? We're saved by grace, um, uh, 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 through faith in Jesus, right? So we are not saved because of the things we do. But this scripture is saying this, work hard to show the results of your salvation, so now the scripture is telling us we must work to reveal the evidence that we do belong to Christ. We do this in the way we live in obedience to God. And we do this in when, when we show reverence and fear of the Lord. When we receive an instruction from God, we receive it and we reverence it and we walk with fear of the Lord, which means it's a, it's a high reverence for God. We don't mock God and we don't mock his instructions, but we live and reverence and obedience to God. So we work hard at showing the results. I'm saved. I'm, I'm walking with the Lord and I'm going to continue to allow God to work within me. But check this out. This is very cool what God does. So we have a work, but God also has a work. And this is what he does. Verse 13, for God is working. That's so cool. So we're working hard, says, to show the results of our salvation. But also God is working. We're working and also God is working. What is God doing? It says, God is working in you. How? By doing what? By giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. What a blessing that God works within us by giving. It's a gift here. He begins to give us the power and the desire to do what pleases Him. So every time we do something that pleases God, it actually comes from God. He's the one that gives us the desire to do it and the power to do it. We can't do anything to please God without God's help. We can't do anything to honor His name without the Holy Spirit's help. The Holy Spirit has to be there behind, the, behind everything. So, But this is so cool that God would give us that desire. So if you, don't ever, if you feel like there's times you don't have the desire or the power to do what pleases God, then I want to encourage you, let your obedience to do, uh, let your obedience do its work. Just obey when you don't feel like it. Obey. Pummel your body into submission. Discipline yourself and say, I'm going to do this, whether I feel like it or not. And also let God do his work in you. Let, and let the result be more power and more desire to do, what ple- uh, to do what pleases God. As you begin to obey and live more for God, you begin to see the power to do uh, what pleases God and the desire begin to rise up more and more within you. I've heard this and I know it to be true just because of experience. The more we begin to obey God, the more we begin to study his word and do what he's called us to do, the more appetite we have to live and honor the name of God. And uh, 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 let's keep going. Verse 14, we're almost there. Let's keep going. It says, do everything without complaining and arguing. Now, this is good. We want to make sure, I know I think we're all guilty of this, of one way or another. We, we probably have complained here or there, but um, the truth is no one's going to call you out more on this than you. You are going to be the one to catch yourself. So, so you got to catch yourself, and that's what we have to do. We have to catch ourselves before we're tempted to let complaining words come out of our mouth. Don't let arguing and complaining take over your verbiage. Don't be a negative talk person because a negative talk person only sees negative and only speaks negative and only lives negative and we have negative self-talk. But let's be a God perspective person where we speak life, we look at the God perspective of things like Paul is, he's in jail and he still has joy. 
Let's be, let's be Christ-minded. Let's put on the attitude of Christ in everything that we do and find the joy and find the God in everything we do. Let's keep going. Verse 15 says, so that no one can criticize you. It says, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. So we ought to live blameless lives Live pure lives in, in a crooked generation, in a crooked time. The way we shine our lights is by living that pure, living in purity and living in blamelessness when the world is perverse. You know, I, I, I've, I've, had, I've had people tell me, and this isn't, again, this is not to boast of myself, it's, uh, but I've had people tell me, like, you know, they say things like, I knew you were a Christian. You just had a different vibe. They'll say something like that. I've, I've had someone tell me this is just the other day. But really what he, what he was saying was, I, I can see the light. I can see Jesus in you because you're different than what I see in every day, in the world every day. And that's the way we should live. Our lives should be preaching the gospel without us even have to say anything. And I think it's good that we do say, we do preach the gospel, but our lives should match up to that. Does your life match up to the gospel? Let's keep going. It says this. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. Hold firmly to the word of life. So we know that there's nothing else that's going to sustain us and help us to grow except for the word of God. Let's keep going. In verse 17, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice and I will share your joy. Paul is literally saying that his life is being poured out like an offering before God. Back in the day, they used to pour out an offering. And um, even they used to sacrifice a, a, a lamb and and and. It'll be poured out like an offering before God. But what Paul's saying is, I'm pouring my life out as an offering. In other words, he's saying my life is totally 100% offered in service to God and nothing of me is being kept from him, not an ounce of me. I'm pouring it all out before God as a service and we can rejoice in that. Our full joy will come when we live lives that are in service to God. When we start to, that's, it's when we start to hold things back from God that we start to experience the pain and the discomfort and the lack of fulfillment and the lack of purpose and, and, and something is missing in my life. And the reason why is because we're holding back from God. Let your life be a total offering before God in service to Him, in ministry to Him. And I believe you're going to experience joy like you never have before. Let's keep going. And now in verse 19, all the way to verse 30, we can this we can kind of sum up in um and right here paul is recognizing he's giving honor to two guys that have been his ride or dies and they are examples for us i even uh, for us too of how to live in service to god so it goes on to say if the lord jesus is willing i hope to send timothy to you soon for a visit then he can cheer me up by telling me how you are getting along i have no one else like timothy now who's timothy it's Paul's disciple. It's like his right-hand guy. He's raising up Timothy to be really a pastor and a leader of the church and, and, to, and to care for the church. So he says, I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares for your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you know how Timothy has proved himself. Like a son with his father, he has served with me in preaching the good news. I hope to send him to you just as soon as I find out what is going to happen to me here. And I have confidence from the Lord that I myself will come to see you soon. So he's giving props to Timothy. Timothy is getting highlighted here. But why is Timothy getting highlighted? It's not for his super giftedness in communication. It's not for his amazing ability to lead. It's not for his discipleship making skills and all this thing. Um, although all those things are great and they're good, he's getting highlighted here because of his care for the people. He's more interested in the people's welfare and other people being cared for and being discipled and, and taken care of than in his own well-being. 
And this is truly the way to represent what Jesus cares about. If you want to care what Jesus care for what Jesus cares about, then care for people, care for their welfare more than your own. And then let's look at who else he's highlighting. He's highlighting another guy, Epaphroditus. Now that's a that's a great name there, Epaphroditus. Look at verse 25. Meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. I love that. Those are great titles to have. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. I'm sending him because he has been longing to see you, and he was very distressed that you heard he was ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him and also on me, so that I would not have one sorrow after another. So God spared Epaphroditus' life. He was sick even to the point of death. But look at this. So I'm all the more anxious to send him back to you. Paul's saying, like, I'm, I'm excited to send him to you. For I know he will be glad. Uh, I'm, I know you will be glad to see him. Then I will not be so worried about you. Welcome him with Christian love and with great joy. And give him the honor that people like him deserve. He's saying there's, a, there's people that have worked hard for the ministry, even to the point of death. They've sacrificed everything. Give them honor that they deserve. I'd encourage you, your leaders, your pastors, people that have worked hard to serve and care for you, give them honor. And, you know, we shouldn't, do, we shouldn't work and serve and minister so that we can try and receive honor. That's never the point. That's not the goal. But we should always be ready and eager to give honor to those who have given so much to spread the gospel and the good news of Jesus. So like Epaphroditus, Paul is telling the church, you know, give him some honor. Love him. Care for him. Lift him up in prayer because he's done so much to care for you. And then this is the last verse here, verse 30. For he he risked his life for the work of Christ, and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. Epaphroditus here is a living example and was obedient even to the point of death, just like Christ was, just like we saw in verses earlier. He followed Christ's example, and if he can do it, so can we. Let's follow Christ's example. Let's love. Let's care for people. So in summary, just to summarize this whole thing, let's live in unity and humility. Let's care for each other. Let's have the right attitude as Christ did, and let's live in obedience to God. And let's do all of this with the right heart and with the right attitude. And let God work in you and be an example of who Jesus is to the world. We love you so much. Thank you again so much for tuning in with us. This has been our overview of Philippians chapter 2. It may have been a little more in depth, but I believe that you're going to be blessed. Study for yourselves. Go in the scripture for yourselves. Get the word of God in your spirit. And I believe it's going to bless you and it's going to... It's going to produce fruit in your lives. We love you so much. God bless you and have a wonderful rest of your day.